Now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello, I'm Tiki Fullerton, every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Well, coming up, mortgage brokers fight back against Kenneth Haynes' attack on their business model. Mortgage choice fell 30% on the news of the report, and boss Susan Mitchell comes in to give us a piece of her mind. Back to Parliament and politicians face off with an eye to the budget and the May election. Shadow Assistant Treasurer Andrew Lee on the Banking Royal Commission and what Labour has to offer voters. And a slew of results, tougher times for Challenger and the good times roll for Macquarie Bank. What does the market make of it all? Tribeca Investment Partners June Bailu brings her insights. Well, yes, we're just over a week since Kenneth Hayne delivered his watershed final report. We're back for a final two weeks of Parliament before it rises. I don't think it comes back until after the budget. Uh, that's not until, what, April? Labour has accepted pretty much carte blanche all the recommendation of, uh, recommendations of Kenneth Hayne, including the controversial one on mortgage broking. The idea would be a model which moves from the bank paying the broker to the customer who's looking for the loan to pay it instead. That way, says Kenneth Hayne, the conflict of interest will be eliminated. Well, the government is not so sure about this recommendation. It's the only one that it's not going to act on, it says. There's now all sorts of argy-bargy in Parliament about the pace of implementing the recommendations. And we'll hear from Shadow Treasurer Andrew Lee shortly on how Labour is travelling. Now, I know that the Hain fallout claimed both a chairman and a CEO of a big bank last week, but really this change around mortgage broking is turning out to be one of the most fundamental. The uncertainty in the market around mortgage broking is a concern. AMP shares went up as vertical integration is now here to stay, we know, but shares in mortgage brokers were walloped. Shares in Mortgage Tro Choice, 25% owned by Commonwealth Bank and part of its planned spin-off of mortgage broking assets, those shares fell 30% on the news. Since then, mortgage brokers have hit back with what's been called a remake of the HIV Grim Reaper ads. Here it is. What would a world without mortgage brokers look like? Possible legislation changes threatening the mortgage broking industry could reduce Australians' access to many lenders and mean even less access to credit. As competition and choice decline, bank power and the risk of higher interest rates will increase, leaving Australians to pay the price. Without mortgage brokers, you could pay more while the banks profit. Sign our petition to keep competition alive. So the broker message that these changes by Hain will deliver even more power to those nasty banks screwing customers into the bargain. Well, how will Haynes' recommendations impact companies like Mortgage Choice, whose bread and butter is, after all, mortgage broking? It's got a market cap of over $100 million, and its shares are currently in the doldrums, down around 20% overall since the Hain report was released. Where to for the future of Mortgage Choice? I spoke with CEO Susan Mitchell a little earlier. Susan Mitchell, very nice to have you in here. Now, when that Hain report came down... Shares in mortgage choice plummeted more than 30%. What was your reaction when you first saw the report? I knew some of those things were possibilities. I just never thought that they would all be a package all at once. I just didn't believe that he would go as far as the consumer paid. The Treasury has not recommended that. The Productivity Commission did not recommend that. I just thought that was a step too far. Why did you think he did it? I think he personally really philosophically believes that he's doing the right thing. I mean, are you the victim of, 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 a, of a hot housing market to start off with? Well, I don't know that we're a victim of a housing market. It's, it's unfortunate that all these things are happening at one time. Mm. I actually believe that he philosophically believes that we should be paid by the consumer, just like the financial planning. He sees it as advice. Mm. I think there are many differences. And I think it looks lovely to just slot it right into something that already exists. But I'm not sure when you get down to the practicalities of actually implementing that they're going to see that it really kind of doesn't work. Well, let's talk a bit more about that. But let me quote him. That present sy system of remunerating mortgage brokers is conflicted remuneration. The chief value of trailing commissions to the recipient, to put it bluntly, is that, it's, is that it's money for nothing. You know, it's funny, if you go back and you look at some history, we used to be paid a large upfront, 
before, say 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and then the banks found that there was some churning, so the agreement was to take half up front and spread the rest over a period of time. So it was absolutely deferred remuneration up front, and you didn't get all the remuneration if you've done the wrong thing, if your loan went into arrears, if there was fraud, mm -hmm. or if perhaps the customer was in the wrong type so of loan. So this is all part of the fee, because it makes a huge yes, difference to, absolutely. obviously, the, the, the net absolutely. present value of the whole thing. Absolutely. So that's the way, that's how Trail started. Yeah. And then it sort of grew into a little bit more, and then somehow it morphed into fee for service after the loan. But it actually started as an upfront that the banks wanted to spread over time to make sure that you didn't churn. But you agree it is conflicted advice. I mean, there's a lot of conflicted advice in the, in the financial system, but you, you would agree it's conflicted. If we define conflicted as anything based on the amount of the loan, it meets the definition. But does that mean absolutely that there's a better system that is actually not conflicted? Mm. We've been through a lot with the, the combined industry forum. We've been through a lot of the different versions of what a fee so, could look like, and mm. none of them work. They all have conflicts. Okay, so what if I said to you that, that the industry could have nipped this in the bud by the, 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 the big banks just charging a flat fee? Going to brokers, big banks charge the flat fee, and that's it. So you don't have the lender having to pay. And this could have all gone away and Hayden would have looked elsewhere. That sounds great. It all depends on what the fee is. Right. Because the fees that CBA has been talking about in their testimony, yeah. if you'll notice, they were 35% of what the current fee is. That's not just charging a flat fee. That's actually charging so low a fee that you actually make the broker channel non-viable. Mm. That is a completely different discussion. What's going to happen, do you think? I mean, uh, Kenneth Hayne is throwing up ideas of the Dutch model, and indeed, if Labour get in, they're adopting everything, and it uh, looks like we're going to go that way with the Dutch model of the borrower actually paying for the service of finding a loan from the mortgage broker. Now, the thing I don't like about the Dutch model, first of all, is that it just raises the cost of the mortgage for the consumer because they're not paying the broker, they pay at the branch or they pay at the broker. It's about 2,000 to 3,000 euros, which is probably about four, five thousand dollars here. Mm. So that's quite a bit. The second thing is, is it's deductible. In their tax system, all those things are deductible. So it ends up being a little bit less of a charge, and the government needs to accept the fact that they're now going to have another deduction and a reduced tax flow. The other thing that's really fascinating is if you go and look at the number of Dutch banks, they've halved in the last 10 years mm -hmm. since they brought this in. Banks so, or brokers? Banks. Yeah. So we have people on saying the brokers aren't affected, but it's now one of the most concentrated financial services environments in Europe. Now, you tell me that that's actually helped with competition. Well, I don't I believe it. Interestingly, Marnie uh, Baker was speaking to our reporter, uh, Leo Shanahan, this week, uh, Managing Director at Bendigo in Adelaide. Uh, she doesn't like um, the, uh, the, the, the current model of mortgage broking. She says uh, that, it, that it is, uh, what does she say? She's, uh, she, she says that current arrangements enhance the risk of poor advice. The reason they talk about poor advice, I'm going to go back to the ASIC report. The whole idea of, of poor advice is that the loans are larger and the loans have a higher LVR. That's what they've hung their hat on as poor advice. If you go to the documents from the Royal Commission, ANZ sent a letter in that showed their flows over 2018. And you can see the flows that went through the branch and the flows that went through the proprietary. Mm -hmm. In the branch, there are 18,000 that come under the 100,000 and there's only like 2,000. I probably have my numbers off, yeah. about, but this is, I'm in the right direction, yeah. that are under 100,000. So what happens in the bank is it's completely skewed towards existing borrowers who are already several years into their loan coming back to borrow money to redo their kitchen. Yeah. So it completely skews the data from the two channels. So they are hanging their hat and they are interpreting the data incorrectly. I cannot see that, that there's actually, when you actually get to the bottom and took up the top-ups, that there's actually evidence of misbehavior by the broker channel. Were you surprised with, with Marnie Baker's comments? I was surprised. Sorry, I got a little on tangent there. Yeah. Um, I was a little bit surprised because Adelaide and Bendigo Bank, brokers are actually very important to Adelaide Bank. They have mm. a large third-party um, 
system and they also have a large securitized system which would be done through a broker. So now, I was a little surprised. What do you make of my colleague Alan Kohler in The Australian today? Uh, look, he, he doesn't like uh, Kenneth Haynes' recommendations. He, he worries that if, you, if you're charging the borrower up front that that will uh, impact the market. But his, his response is, yes, there is conflicted advice. It is all wrong. Why don't mortgage brokers just become banks? I don't Let's have get a, rid of the mortgage broker. Yeah, I, I get that yeah. part. Um, but then you're back to, if you get rid of the mortgage brokers, you're back to the fundamental reasons that mortgage brokers are here, which is to introduce competition into the market and to take borrowers to some of the other banks. Isn't it an online like It's line not thing, an online like world yet. Okay, let's talk about that one yeah. then. Opaque pricing. We just had a review from the ACCC where they went through and they looked at the pricing. We have one of the most opaque price systems in the world for pricing. So when you go to compare the market, you don't know what you're going to pay. You know what the standard is. You know what the advertised discounts are. You don't know what the unadvertised discounts are. Mm -hmm. You don't know what your price is until you actually turn your application into the bank and you find out what your discount is. Yeah. That is why you go to a mortgage broker. It is price discovery and financial education. They can tell you the price across four or five different banks that yeah. you cannot figure out from comparethemarket.com. It what? is not, as Mr. Haynes said, like going to a hotel website. What uh, do you think is going to happen to mortgage choice and mortgage brokers, the sector, when this presumably comes through? I think if you go back to the fundamentals, there's still 60% of the, the populace that wants to use a broker. More, the Royal Commission does not change that market structure So even a, an way. upfront fee for a borrower you're still going to be there as a yeah, Absolutely. It depends on the quantum. Yeah. If, when we were talking earlier, we were talking about where we started. We're really kind of going back to where we started. Yes. You have a large enough upfront fee, and that will then cover the broker's activities, yeah. and we will absolutely evolve yes. because we have evolved before. Yes. When I spoke to Matt Common, uh, mm -hmm. CBA chief executive, he said it's still all go uh, to, um, you know, spinning off, you guys, mm -hmm. um, and um, and then presumably um, you'll be. I mean, shareholders at the moment of CBA will be thinking, "Gosh, your <laughs> this asset of mortgage choice has gone down a lot. Uh, can you see it still going through this spin-off?" Um, absolutely, because his spin-off has nothing to do with really with mortgage choice. Mm -hmm. They only hold a 17% stake in mortgage choice, and they do not have a board seat. They have a, a full controlling interest in Aussie. Yes. Both of these are in that pot. I think this is more about I don't want um, associated brokers or associated financial planners as part of my model going forward. I'm simplifying yes. my model. So this is, has to do with what he sees as his model. So you still see it's going to go ahead, Aussie, and th that 17% stake going to be spun off? I've heard nothing to the contrary, okay. and it appears to align with his vision for CBA, yes. and he, need the, he needs those to leave. Okay. But the reality is he's kept financial planners. Yes. They're just employed. Okay. Last question. Uh, look, we've just seen these mortgage broker ads uh, out uh, yes, this week. Well, uh, but they've been compared to the sort of Grim Reaper ads of times past. I would compare them more to the hugely successful Fox and the Hen House ads. Oh, I like was, that. was that was that inspired from them? I'm not exactly sure what the inspiration is. The most important thing about that campaign is that it's the entire mortgage industry working together. Yeah. Everyone has made a contribution to but that campaign. But it's the big bad banks. Isn't it? It's like the Fox and the Hen House, the big bad bank at the end of the corridor. I think it's trying to remind customers what these recommendations are doing. Mm -hmm. They're hurting small business, they're making the consumer pay more, and they're putting more in the pockets of the big banks. Susan Mitchell, great to talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. After the break, Shadow Assistant Treasurer Andrew Lee discusses his take on the Hain Royal Commission and key policies Labour will be taking to the May election. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Fortnite. You must have heard of it. A shooter survival video game to fight off zombie-like creatures and defend objects and with fortifications that they can build. Sounds rather like this current fortnight in Parliament, doesn't it? The last fortnight of sitting before the budget, which much to Labour's frustration, of course, because there's plenty to battle over late this afternoon. The government introduced two Hain amendments around super, aimed no doubt at industry funds. First in relation to junkets, think 
request and uh, second civil penalties for breach of duties of trustees. Well, Andrew Lee, Labour's Shadow Assistant Treasurer, joined me earlier. Andrew Lee, very good to talk again. Now, I haven't spoken to you since the Hain report came down. What did you make of it? Well, Dickie, great to be with you. And uh, this certainly is a hard-hitting report, uh, the most seismic report into banking I think the country has ever seen. Uh, it's uh, pointed out a whole lot of rorts and rip-offs and uh, suggested a way forward, uh, which I believe is a, is a constructive and thoughtful one. It's not as, uh, as bad as some uh, shareholders had been anticipating. Mm. After all, bank shares rose on the announcement of the report. They did indeed. Uh, Labor believes we ought to implement the implement the recommendations in full. Uh, we're a little disappointed. The coalition, the, the same party that voted against a Royal Commission 26 times, is now crab-walking away from its recommendations. Well, it's, it's only crab-walking away... to sit it, to begin implementing it. It's only crab-walking away from, I think, one of them, which is really around this idea of, of mortgage brokers. Now, we've had Susan Mitchell, uh, who runs Mortgage Choice, on today. Um, she is very concerned that actually adopting a sort of Dutch model as uh, Kenneth Hayne recommends getting lenders to pay to find uh, a loan is actually just going to deliver more, uh, less competition and uh, more dollars for the big banks. We always said before the recommendations were handed down that uh, parties shouldn't be picking and choosing among them. Uh, that we'd set Ken Hayne an important job to do, Labor campaign for this Royal Commission since 2016. Mm. We needed to take those recommendations seriously. Uh, and as the report points but out, you and question as them reports have noted, well, it's, it's important to look through them with a critical eye. Uh, but we believe this is a pl blueprint for reform, and Labor would be implementing it straight away if we were in office. Uh, in the area of uh, mortgage brokers in particular, uh, they have the potential to play a, a valuable pro-competitive role. Uh, Two-thirds of mortgages almost are going through mortgage brokers now. Uh, but it's important that they're acting for the customer and that they're not, they don't have incentives to steer customers towards mortgages that aren't the best deal. OK. Andrew, just on uh, default super, Kenneth Hain had recommendations around uh, ju just having one default, uh, which was quite significant, obviously. I just wondered what you thought of Paul Howe's uh, suggestion from KPMG that another better way might be to encourage uh, people to default, yes, more than once, but that your super should travel with you. Would that uh, be something that Labor might look at? Diggy, we're minded to stick with the Royal Commission's recommendation that you have a single default product. Uh, certainly there are switching costs in the market and we're uh, uh, cognizant of making sure that uh, people aren't paying bigger fees than they ought to be. Uh, we know in Australia we have a world-class superannuation system, a legacy of uh, Paul Keating and of the union movement originally, uh, but that the fees are still too high. and uh, We've got to get those fees as low as possible until Australians' retirement savings are higher. Presumably the, the unions, though, some of the industry funds and certainly the unions, would favour Paul Howes' proposal. We're not about uh, worrying about who, which particular group favours which reform. We're about making sure that Australians have as much to retire on in, uh, as, as they need. Uh, the purpose of superannuation is to reduce reliance on the pension. Uh, that system, set up by prior Labor governments, is the envy of many advanced countries. Uh, and the recommendations of the Royal Commission, again, are recommendations that Labor would implement. All right, well, let's go to some of your policies ahead of this very, very, very important election. Uh, you say you're, you want to ensure that Australians have uh, as much to retire on as they need. Going to your controversial policy on, uh, on franking credits, now, um, Labor has has organized carve outs obviously for the less well off but there are now self-funded retirees who will actually be worse off under your policy than pensioners as a result of these changes uh, why shouldn't they be given carve outs as well well, so refundable imputation credits go to only one in out of every 25 Australians. Uh, it's a policy that no other country has. Uh, no other country uh, provides tax, uh, tax checks to people who've paid no tax. We don't have any other tax uh, credits in the system that are refundable, in fact. 
And Tiki, you've got to ask yourself, imagine that uh, we didn't have this policy and somebody now said, well, uh, let's have a special policy for uh, those who uh, don't have any taxable income and own shares. Mm. Let's write them a cheque every year. Mm. I think people would think that was daft and it wouldn't be a higher priority than schools and hospitals and reducing elective emergency surgery waiting lists. Yes. But that's the system we've got today. Yeah, and, and sure, and I don't disagree with you, but given that it is the system that we've got today and uh, people ho who have, you know, small business people, people who've put their savings in and worked jolly hard to create their nest eggs have invested on the basis that this policy would hold out for as long as they did. Uh, now, they, they obviously are going to be hit really badly, but you're happy to throw them under a bus. Uh, you look at the, where the benefits of this uh, tax concession go, uh, more than half goes to people with more than two and a half million dollars in their superannuation accounts. Mm -hmm. As you say, we've carved out pensioners, so whether you're on a full or a part pension, you're unaffected by Labor's dividend imputation changes. But we have to do it, Tiki, because we have debt having doubled under the Liberals. Uh, net debt is, uh, is now uh, crashed through the $350 billion barrier, uh, and that's uh, meant that uh, Australia struggles to be able to fund the schools and hospitals, the public services that people want. Yeah. Uh, we can't continue to be a country with the biggest tax lurks in the world and have the best social services in the world. Uh, Labor believes we have to put uh, investing in social services first uh, ahead of this very regressive tax concession which is unique to Australia. How do you think you're going to get Australia's debt down, Andrew? We need to close tax loopholes. So uh, my uh, public finance professor, Martin Feldstein, talked about the importance of closing tax expenditures, and he was a Republican, somebody who had chaired Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisers. Uh, the notion that the tax system uh, should be uh, uh, as integral as, as possible, should have as few unwarranted loopholes as possible, wouldn't be a left-right issue. This is a pragmatic issue of sensible tax reform. Yeah. We also want to make sure multinationals pay their fair share, cracking down on tax havens, and our plan there would raise billions of dollars for the budget bottom line. Yeah. The Coalition's gone soft on multinationals, soft on tax havens. We'll make sure that they contribute their fair share uh, if, so we if, can fund if, things like if, preschool if, for three-year-olds. Yes, if I could interrupt this just for a moment. But, um, I mean, tax loopholes sure. and, and uh, getting the tax back from multinationals is, uh, is something that all politicians in opposition say they will get right onto. Every time, though, it seems to be remarkably difficult to actually get the dollars through the door. We're not just putting out uh, broad principles, Tiki. We've put out costed, detailed policies, carefully costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office, which is an equal status co costed to the Treasury, mm -hmm. uh, worked through with the experts. Uh, if we're elected in, uh, in, in a couple of months' time, we will hit the ground with a more carefully thought through economic plan than any opposition in my lifetime. And we believe that that's what Australians deserve. That's why Bill Shorten, Chris Bowen, Jim Chalmers and the Labor economic team have been working through so carefully uh, our policies because we don't believe that Australians should elect an opposition who then behaves differently when they win office. We want to govern exactly the way we promised uh, from opposition. So, now, does that include delivering negative gearing in uh, a ban on never negative gearing in the near future? Because obviously that is central to uh, your economic policy. But we do have this very softening property market. When would that policy, were you to be in government, when would that policy be implemented? Well, it'll take effect after the election, and as uh, we see the budget coming down uh, and we've got those uh, budget numbers, we'll announce the start date in that policy. But it's the same one we took to the 2016 election. We've said if you're currently uh, negative gearing, uh, your investments won't be affected, not by our negative gearing changes, not by our capital gains tax changes. But from the start date going forward, if you want to take advantage of negative gearing, you'll have to buy a new built property. You'll have to add to the total housing stock. Mm -hmm. And that deals with the problem that right now the home ownership rate is as low as it's been in 60 years. That we're in the bottom third of advanced countries for home ownership. We're increasingly becoming a country that can't afford to house its young. Uh, we've got to de deal with that, uh, that challenge. This isn't about smoothing the ups and downs of the property cycle. This is about rebalancing away from investors and towards first home buyers. Mm. Uh, Andrew, Lee, finally, um, Scott Morrison, Prime Minister, was on his feet this week at the press club. Um, he's claiming credit, uh, the economic high ground, a uh, million, a million jobs created. He's stopped the illegal boat trade. Uh, he's managing the finances 
better than the Labour Party, who was reckless on national security and the economy. Now, um, does this, is this the Achilles heel once again appearing in the election campaign, this issue of national security? And it's important uh, to Labor that we keep our borders safe. Uh, in the context of uh, asylum seekers, we believe we can be appropriately compassionate with people who believe who need medical treatment uh, while maintaining the integrity of our borders. Uh, but we uh, also uh, doubt uh, Prime Minister Morrison's claim that the Australian economy is as good as it gets. Uh, living standards have stagnated under him, grown much less than they did under the la last Labor government. Yeah. Uh, wage growth is in the doldrums, and Scott Morrison doesn't have a single policy that will increase wage growth in this country and deal with the crisis in retail trade that we're seeing right now. But and we've got net debt having yes. uh, more than doubled under the Liberals, uh, and they have no serious plan for bringing that down because they were your... fight ticky yes. for every little tax loophole. But does your great pitch on, you know, we've, we've actually got policies now going forward, some of them are not uh, easy, but we're standing by them all the time. Does this all now um, seem to be at risk because the government is pushing this national security issue? And if, if, if Labor capitulates, uh, it makes them look the weaker party. If it drives this policy through somehow uh, on, uh, on um, uh, refugees coming back for medical um, treatment, then, you know, as people say, you know, you've got two doctors within the Greens and the Labour Party, they could be the ones deciding. I mean, it, it's, it's really being taken over at the moment. Are you at risk of destroying this great opportunity you've got to get back into government? It's about the policy for me, not about the politics. Mm. Uh, Labor's got a strong record on national security. Uh, and on the issue of uh, asylum seeker transfers, uh, we believe it's appropriate to be compassionate to those people who are sick without weakening our borders. Uh, we've taken the advice from the security agencies and we've proposed a, a number of uh, amendments to the Phelps bill, uh, including uh, extending the time frame, uh, ex slightly expanding the ministerial discretion over se uh, security issues, and ensuring that it only applies to the current cohort in Manus Nauru. We're having constructive conversations with crossbenchers there, and we'll continue to work that through productively, taking the sensible, centrist ground uh, that Labor, uh, Labor has always adopted. All right. Ten short days of Parliament left, I know. Uh, so I hope you go well. Uh, all the best, and thanks for talking to us. Thanks, Dickie. After the break, breaking down today's moves in those companies with results. Challenger, Macquarie Bank, Transurb and June Bay Lou from Tribeca Investment Partners will crunch the numbers next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Yes, welcome back. Well, Challenger Financial living up to downbeat expectations after flagging the bad news last month. Half-yearly net profits dropped 97% from $195 million to $6 million. But the company is still expecting a full-year normalised profit in line with revised guidance at between $545-565 million. Revenue declined 20% to $893 million, signifying further pain for shareholders who have seen the share price plunge over 40% over the past Last year, company's fully franked interim dividend of 17.5 cents remains the same as last year. Share price already taking a hit in January following the profit guidance there. Well, for more on these results and a few others, June Bay Lu from Tribeca Investment Partners joins me live from our CBD studio. Uh, June Bay Challenger is a really interesting stock. It was such a market darling in previous years. Um, how do you unpack these results? Because the share price, of course, went up a bit, didn't it? Yeah, look, the share price has really suffered, and uh, even though they delivered inline results, uh, mm. uh, the investors still yet to pick up confidence in this company. Ultimately, mm. when you take a step back, this is a business that sells annuity products and use that money to reinvest in higher risk uh, investments, and they make that spread. So when the operating environment underlying economic activity becomes weaker, um, the company will struggle to deliver uh, earnings growth. So in the current market environment, it does look very challenging for this business. Yeah, and, and it's such a pioneer in driving annuity products. I mean, that's presumably where we've all got to go uh, with, with this great super challenge. And yet it's the leader and it's struggling. 
Yeah, that's right. Look, I think with the in terms of the actual product on the product front, uh, mm. it will actually receive more inflow um, and as well as increased demand for that product. The biggest risk is really where they put that money. Um, quite a lot of its assets sitting in those mezzanine debts as well as uh, uh, on the uh, on the property front. So it's just in the current uh, ec economic outlook, um, it just seems very very difficult for investors to step up and uh, support the company. Okay, well, let's move on to Transurban. Now, again, another really interesting company. Gosh, Scott Charlton has a lot on his plate, hasn't he? What, what do investors think of it? Yeah, look, the result was somewhat disappointing, actually. Um, uh, surprisingly, um, the traffic number is a little bit weaker, um, and uh, they make up a lot of earnings come from increasing toll prices. Um, the question comes down to uh, how much uh, uh, room do you have to move to, um, uh, to before people really stop using some of those toll roads? So um, <laughs> it, it does look like the, the outlook looks a little bit challenging. Uh, so the investors are somewhat skeptical, plus some of this uh, development uh, has had problems um, and uh, seeing the share price down today. Yeah, and, and uh, lots and lots of projects. I mean, issues with North Connects and West mm -hmm. Connects, obviously, they're a part of. But over in the US as well, I saw, uh, I, I know, Sean Declare in the Fin is sort of saying, well, we've got all these projects that uh, Scott Charlton's got to get on with. So the growth beyond that, he's got so much on his plate, he can't look beyond that yet. That's right. It is challenging. Uh, aside from all these things up, um, you still got that funding costs, even though uh, it is stable for some time, uh, given the Fed is pausing. But uh, the, re the l next move still looks like it will be up at some point. So uh, the funding costs will go up and, uh, and it will be quite challenging for them to deliver the to the return. Yeah. OK. Well, Macquarie Bank, Jim Bailu. Now, Shamara Wickramanayake has replaced Nicholas Moore, the god, uh, and yet the results still keep on pumping. So she's obviously got the magic touch as well. Look, absolutely. Uh, look, uh, uh, the share price was up marginally and uh, before the conference call and post the conference call, investors really got that boost of confidence of the company will deliver more than 15 percent, which they guided to uh, in 2019. Um, Shimara has projected a lot of confidence in achieving that number. And then the, uh, the current update seems very, very strong. Just look like a good place to be um, compared to other banks domestically, for sure. Yeah, it's a great global story for us in Australia, I think. Now, look, um, super retail group, uh, June Bay, um, Bill Bertels obviously announced his, um, his departure, his resignation, but uh, it's rather sort of sad timing that they've now got to deal with this underpayment scandal just as he's going. Look, I think this is a challenging company. Obviously, you've got the CEO changes. Um, yeah. And uh, don't forget, they recently just had a, quite a few profit warnings, uh, even though this result was credible. Um, but, uh, you know, as we're heading into an uncertain consumer period, as highlighted by uh, the likes of JB Hi-Fi and a few other retailers, uh, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to see how they will perform in the next period. They do yeah. have some quality assets in that portfolio, but a big part of their business is quite mature. Uh, so it, it, it is quite difficult for that business. OK, finally, uh, just some good news for Amcor, I imagine. Uh, they've got uh, the EU has uh, given their um, approval, their antitrust approval to, uh, to, to uh, buying of, of Bemis. Um, now, that must be good news. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Investors really like that. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. they report a good result as well. Uh, they talk, they're showing the margin improvement, the uh, input cost has fallen. Um, things seem to be going very well for the business. And now that this being approved, um, the potential synergy that might come, come out of it could be quite meaningful in the next little period. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, you know, uh, the share price performance, investors really warming up to that story. Jun Bailu, love the way you get across all these companies. Thank you so much for us. Thank you. Now, last week we were in the thick of the fallout of Kenneth Haynes' final report and the abrupt exit of NAB CEO and chairman. The government was dealing with its own mini-crisis, an attempted cyber attack that we're hearing could have been made by a foreign government. Did you hear about that one? Well, ASIO is currently investigating the breach. Authorities are yet to detect any evidence of data being stolen. For more on this and the growing trend of government cyber attacks, I spoke with Andrew Sonchev, Director of Technology at Darktrace, just a little earlier. Andrew Sonjeff, nice to talk to you. Now, I know you're down here from London. You've been here for a little while. And we've, we've had uh, the Hain review we were all caught up with. Some people might not have seen this cyber attack on the Australian Parliament. How serious was it? 
Well, it's a little bit unclear at the moment exactly how serious it was. Uh, initial disclosures suggest that there's no evidence yet of any data being stolen. Um, but the fact that attackers were able to penetrate uh, the parliamentary systems is obviously of grave concern. Um, this is part of a new and somewhat alarming trend. We saw last month attacks on uh, German MPs, and we've seen attacks on um, EU diplomatic cables. Uh, ever since you know, the DNC hack and the leaking of emails uh, that we had during the US presidential election, this seems to be a new area of focus for attackers in terms of trying to cause political dissent and discredit. So we have uh, two elections coming up, actually, the New South Wales state election and then the federal election. Uh, should ordinary voters be concerned about uh, interference in our elections, do you think? Well, there's nothing uh, in this recent attack to suggest that there's any form of direct election meddling. Um, it's not clear even if this was designed to weigh in in a political influence manner, although the nature of the target somewhat suggests that. Uh, it's also not clear at this stage whether this is the work of a nation state or not. Uh, some initial credible uh, speculation suggested that it might be nation state level attacks, which is a natural Yeah, there was talk about China. To. Yeah, but the, it is worth pointing out that the, uh, the attacks that happened last month in Germany uh, are believed to have been the work of a, a lone individual or a hacktivist group. So there are many people that might wish to interfere with democratic processes. It's not obvious that it would necessarily be transnational interstate action. I think you said hacktivist there, which is an interesting new word, yes. isn't it? Um, so, so uh, you know, if, we, if, if governments, MPs around the world are getting um, attacked, if you like, uh, what is the um, next step in terms of making sure that these institutions have the right defences? Is it possible? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's not like these institutions don't take this very seriously. They already do. I think maybe one of the reasons why we're seeing MPs and parliamentary uh, networks being attacked is that they might be perceived to be at a sort of critical point between having access to very sensitive data but not being as secured and as locked down as critical systems that you might get in, say, inside, say, military systems or inside the intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I don't want to speculate on the maturity of the Australian parliamentary system's defences, but, for example, oh, no, two, years ago in, <laughs> uh, two, two years ago in the UK, there was a series of sort of disclosures that came out that MPs were not following even basic sort of cybersecurity hygiene practices around passwords and stuff in their systems. So it might be a comparatively weak area that attackers can look to gain access to sensitive data. All right. Well, going to the unit that you're in charge of at Dark Trace, which is the industrial unit, uh, um, who are your sorts of clients? What sort of companies are we talking about? Yeah, we work a lot with critical infrastructure around the world. Um, we have a sort of a very well-developed presence here in Australia. And with those companies, we're largely looking to protect them from this sort of high level of cyber attack. Uh, in industrial environments, what you find is that the sorts of systems that control critical infrastructure that run power grids and run trains and manufacturing processes, mm -hmm. those are increasingly being attacked uh, by hackers, not just data theft like we used to focus on. And so those industries uh, are investing very heavily at the moment in AI-based defenses and modern techniques that are able to stop these sorts of attacks before they even get inside the networks. Right, OK. Well, t to this point, uh, one of the things that happens both here and, ar and around the world is that uh, Huawei, the uh, Chinese telco, has actually been banned from taking part in any 5G here uh, because of national security, uh, which goes to some of our critical telecommunications infrastructure. Do you think that was a very sensible decision? I mean, how, how much of, of a risk is a company like Huawei to Australia? Yeah, it's uh, another very difficult one to unpick. There seems to be somewhat of a coordinated effort or at least uh, agreed upon narrative between uh, Western nations around this idea that Huawei particularly should be singled out for concern yeah. when it comes to the, uh, the possibility of them dominating 5G infrastructure as it rolls out. It's natural to, to see why that would be the case. If you have any monopolistic domination by one provider in something as critical as telecoms infrastructure, there's all sorts of concerns that would come up around that. Uh, Huawei and China have done a very good job of getting to the front of the pack in terms of being very uh, proactive in their rollout and their adoption of 5G technology. Um, th there's, there's lots of ways to read this. Um, there's obviously 
the sort of backdrop of, of economic trade war between uh, these nations. Th there may be uh, speculation that this is sort of protectionism or exactly. a way to... Exactly. I've, um, yeah, I've read a couple of articles exactly along those lines that actually America dropped the ball on the tech front and, uh, and China is actually ahead in terms of delivering for, for, the, for the consumer and therefore they're using this cyber um, argument as an excuse. Well, that, that's possible, but it's also worth noting that um, intelligence agencies have, have got involved here, and they've issued warnings to private sector companies to, to not use Huawei tech, and they don't do that lightly. They're not typically involved in uh, putting their hands on the scales in the markets in that way. So I think there are legitimate concerns. It's also worth pointing out that this is a defensive recommendation. Right? What, what the Western governments are saying is to avoid the use of Huawei's tech at home on their own turf. So it's about preventing possible economic espionage by foreign state presences. It's not them talking about our abilities or our cyber offensive capabilities against China or other countries. Mm. So it is asymmetrical in that sense. But, but there's, a, there's an interesting broader conversation here around the idea of who controls the internet. And uh, there's, there's a worry here that we're seeing a sort of balkanization of the internet and a, a breakdown of openness so that you might end up having you know, spheres of influence uh, in the tech world where certain companies uh, are locked into, say, uh, Chinese uh, telecoms providers and certain Western nations are locked into Western companies. And, and the worry there is that the internet's built on freedom and, and openness and interoperability between these sorts of technologies and uh, we don't want to risk shutting that down and, and destroying a lot of the benefits that come from that uh, open standards model that we've worked so hard for. It's a fascinating space. Can I uh, just ask you lastly, uh, we are heading towards open banking uh, in New South Wales and, and, and beyond this year. Uh, what sort of concerns does that uh, throw up in terms of uh, cyber security do you think? Yeah, um, it's, it's one where it raises uh, the possibility and the risk of cyber threat, um, but it's one where we probably can manage it if we, if we do it carefully. It's, it's part of the ongoing push for greater openness, greater interconnectivity, more sharing of data. And that's obviously a very good thing for consumers, and it drives innovation. So the, the opening of data between banking providers is potentially going to do wonderful things for fintech companies and help consumers with uh, more competitive products. But the risk there, obviously, is that there's more data sharing and there's more openness and more access to your data. So if done correctly, it might be a good example of controlled uh, systems and planning actually doing this in a far more safe way than otherwise would happen if it was done in a sort of more uh, cowboyish way. But obviously, the end result will be far more apps, far more services, dipping into the data and far more potential avenues for people's uh, personal information to get compromised. Yeah, yeah. It's a new world as far as I'm concerned. Andrew Sanchev, so interesting to talk yes. to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. After the break, home loan approvals slide in December. We'll get a health check on the property market with Louis Christopher, CEO of SQM Research, next. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, the bad news shows no signs of abating for the beleaguered housing market, with the number of home loan approvals slumping over 6% in December, far more than the 2% tipped by analysts. Comes as a falling house prices and tighter regulation continue to squeeze the sector. Meanwhile, the value of loans for investment housing fell nearly 5% in the month. This comes hot on the heels of an increasingly dovish RBA, which last week described the outlook as evenly balanced, with any future rate move to depend on moves in unemployment employment and inflation. Well, for more on those housing figures and outlook for the property market for 2019, I'm pleased to welcome Louis Christopher, CEO of SQM Research. Louis, a very difficult housing market, you'd have to say, at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, those home loan lending numbers were pretty atrocious. Mm. Were you surprised? I was surprised to the magnitude of the declines. So, I mean, there were some big falls there. New South Wales was down 6%. Victoria was down over 6%. Queensland was down 9%. So, month so, so month. what, I mean, there have been many sort of different explanations yeah. for this. What yeah. do you think is the main driver of it? The restrictions in lending were still apparent and there in 2018. Mm -hmm. That coupled with a reduction in confidence in the housing market. Mm -hmm. So we've been seeing a big fall off in investor demand. 
Initially, that was triggered by investors not being able to get a loan. Now they're scared of the housing market. They do not want to actually get the loan. That's really interesting because I've heard now from not one but two very senior um, big bankers that the frustration they have in trying to grow their loans is literally this responsible lending stuff and trying to get people through that bottleneck of the admin that you now have, are required to sign off on. It's a, it's a massive issue apparently. Oh, it's a systematic issue now we've mm. actually applying for a loan. Mm. It's taking on average over four weeks for a good borrower to get the money. Yes. Uh, and on top yes. of that, they're being put through the grill on many a thing. Yeah. We're hearing some crazy stories yeah. now. So internal credit yeah. at banks is just like they've gone right yeah. the thresholds gone way up. Because what's happened here is that the banks are now doing proper reconciliation of everybody's expenses. Yeah. And this is a real issue. The problem is the banks aren't really set up to do this. Yeah. Uh, now you, now, you could say, oh, well, shouldn't they be doing that anyway? But the point, the point is that if this is actually going to stop yeah. business from actually happening yeah. and the banks are comfortable with the um, level of scrutiny that they give to their lenders by themselves, it starts becoming a slightly different issue, doesn't it? Absolutely, it mm. does. Let me give you one story in terms of what we've, we've come across. We know of a borrower had a speeding fine uh, acknowledged by the bank the bank then assumed that that speeding expense was going to happen month after month afterwards. And so their, their borrower's borrowing capacity came down. It's ridiculous stuff like that's going on But right is that, is that uh, just being overly conservative or was that just an administrative error, do you think? Oh, I think it's probably a combination of both. Yeah. I think they are being overly conservative. Yeah. That's the one example. Uh, There's plenty of others out there we're well aware of. Right. And then over and above that, you say yeah. people are now... Look, they just wonder whether they want to get into the housing market at the moment, even though it's falling. I mean, you know, uh, there's nobody sitting there thinking, OK, this is the bottom of the housing market. No, that's right. Uh, very few people uh, believe that we're at the bottom of the housing market. We certainly don't. We think there'll be more falls to come. And the yeah. thing is, investors, they're momentum driven. Yeah. When the market's going up, you see more of them enter into the market. Yes. When the market's going down, they tend to leave and drive. But is it a dramatic... After all, pe most people, certainly, uh, you know, owner occupiers, they yeah. buy their houses to yeah. live in them for some people. Period of, this is true. of time. Yes. So um, I, I just look at, say, Matt Common and Brian Hartz, so CBA and, and, and Westpac. Both of them have come out and they've said, actually, this property market is correcting not in a bad way and it's not going to be curtains, we're not going to go through the floor. Um, you think, why, why is everything such doom and gloom? Well, dwelling prices are now off by 11.5% in Sydney. That's a big decline. But are they going to go no off by another 11.5% in the next 12 months, two years? We don't know for sure. Yeah. However, we, what we do know is that we've got an up-and-coming federal election yes. where property is a key debating point. Yes. And I think that so that's creating a lot of uncertainty in the market yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, so we, we're well aware of many, many people out there just sitting on the sidelines. Waiting. The interesting thing is, uh, I guess you've got the you've got the um, election in, say May. Say Labor get in. Yes. Uh, when are we going to know actually when their negative gearing policy kicks in? Good question. We're counting on. We think there may well be a mini budget, say in August, where they actually in, formally announce some measures, right. which then kick in, say one July, twenty twenty. Right. Right. OK. Let me quickly ask you about the uh, rentals because you yes. just uh, put out a paper uh, today. Yep. Now, uh, it's a tenant's market. Rental vacancy rates falling. And yes, they, they, vacancy rates fell for the month of January and, and we seasonally we get this every January as many university students come back and they, they look for accommodation. Yes. So there was a seasonal fall. However, if you look through that seasonality, rental vacancy rates are still high. For example, in Sydney, they're running at 3.2%. Oh, right. That's very much a tenant's market. Right. We expect in February vacancy rates will fall again because of seasonality, but thereafter, they'll very much likely rise. So what's been happening to prices? They've been falling. Rents have been falling. Mm -hmm. So Sydney rents are off by about 2 to 3%. Melbourne's mm -hmm. slightly up. Uh, overall, the national rental scene is very flat in terms of uh, uh, what rents are actually doing. So uh, outlook this year overall, do you reckon? Oh, gee, it's a tenant's market and it's a buyer's market and it'll become even more of a buyer's market and even more of a tenant's market overall. Louis Christopher, that is very interesting news. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Bleak though it is. All right, well, that is all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, CSL's Paul Perot on the company's half-year results. Until then, thanks for your company.